Good morning. Um, we will begin with the invocation on this morning. Um, and this is an opportunity that we would ask you to stand if you are able to do so. If you would please bow with me. Dear Heavenly Father, Jehovah, Allah, Creator, we come to you right now just asking for a special blessing and covering over today. Father, we know that today is a celebration of a very great life, um, of an angel that you sent here on earth in order to remind us about unity, equality, and justice. And so on today, as we celebrate his legacy, um, the dream, and the reality of who we are to become, we say thank you, we give you all the glory, the honor, and we just ask that you would also bless our speaker and give him the words that will touch our hearts, our minds, and renew our strength. All these things we ask and give you honor. Amen. Amen.
please be seated. Unfortunately, Bishop Hicks could not be here this morning. I'm Maxine Allen, Minister of Multicultural Ministries for the United Methodist Church in Arkansas. Let us be in prayer in unison. We remember the conviction of Martin Luther King Jr. that freedom is never voluntarily given by the oppressor. It must be demanded by the oppressed. Therefore, let us pray for courage and determination by those who are oppressed. We remember Martin's warning that a negative peace, which is absence of tension, is less than a positive peace, which is the presence of justice. Therefore, let us pray for those who work for peace in this world, in our world, and cry out first for justice. Amen. We remember Martin's insight that injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. We are caught in an incapable net network of much lighter tide in a single garment of destiny. Wherever affects one directly affects all indirectly. Therefore, let us pray that we may see nothing in isolation, but that we may know ourselves bound to one another in all people under heaven. We remember Martin's lament that contemporary church is a weak, ineffectual voice with an uncertain sound. It is so often the arch supporter of the status quo. Far from being disturbed by the presence of the church, the power structure of the average community is consoled by the church's silent and often vocal sanction of things as they are. Therefore, let us pray that neither this congregation nor any congregation of Christ's people be silent in the face of wrong but that we may be distributors of the status quo when that is God's call to us. We remember Martin's hope that dark clouds of racial prejudice will soon pass away and the deep fog of misunderstanding will be lifted from our fear-drenched communities. And in some not too distant tomorrow, the radiant stars of love and brotherhood will shine over our great nation with all their scintillating beauty. Therefore, in faith, let us commend ourselves and our work for justice to the goodness of the Almighty God. Amen. Good morning. Good morning. If there is a seat next to you, raise your hand so we can make room for those who are. There are a lot of seats. Y'all come on down. Let's. Everybody. Before I begin, I was asked to assist with some acknowledgments. I know that there are a number of elected officials here, um, including Senator Pryor and uh, Shane Broadway and the chairman of the Republican Party in Arkansas. If you're an elected official, will you please stand? All of the elected officials. Thank you. I'm, I'm listed to do Greetings, but normally when we have this whole when we host this program, which goes back now uh, about 15 years, I really like to take my few minutes since this is my house uh, to, to give you a challenge. And so I want to be consistent with my personality. Um, so once again, we, we want to thank the King Commission for this relationship that dates back to the mid 90s. And we're proud to play a role in this event. As I indicated, I try to use this time not to just welcome you because you should know by now that you're always welcome here. This is your college. So instead of offering a welcome, let me call you to act. I submit to you that Dr. King's legacy is being attacked and we need to set the record straight. So what am I talking about? 10 years ago, Michael Eric Dyson wrote, I may not get there with you, the true Martin Luther King Jr. 
In that text, he writes, terms like equal playing field, racial justice, and equal opportunity, and most ominous, colorblind, drip from the lips of formerly stalwart segregationist politicians, conservative policy wonks, and intellectual hire guns for deep-pocketed right-wing think tanks. Affirmative action is rendered as reverse racism, while goals and timetables are remade in sinister fashion into quotas. These unscrupulous actors proclaim that King somehow advocated a colorblind society as evidenced by the 34 words in the I Have a Dream speech that spoke of the content of our character rather than the color of our skin. Dyson writes, if King's hope for radical social change is, is to survive, we must wrest his complex meaning from their harmful embrace. This leads me to yesterday's utterly ridiculous and blasphemous editorial by Paul Greenberg entitled Radical as Conservative. Predictably, he uses those 34 words Dyson points out that stalwart segregationists use. He writes, is any passage more frequently cited against the quota system called affirmative action? Is any passage so clear a call for what conservatives always seem to be calling for, a renewed faith in the American dream, a colorblind society in which we are judged on our individual merits, not group identity? Greenberg then attacks with those familiar phrases, equal opportunity racism, the new racism, and intolerance with social justice being any government program the speaker currently favors. Dyson clearly described what happens here all the time, the pimping of Martin Luther King Jr. to make a point that King would flatly be against. So my challenge for you today is to read King for yourself. Read one of the dozens of speeches, sermons, articles, and books that give you a broader range of King's thinking, and then call out those who misuse King to support their personal ideology. King Day 2010, for me, is call-out day. And so I'm calling out Paul Greenberg for shamelessly rep misrepresenting Dr. King. Every year, every year I've been here, the paper prints, I have a dream. And then he writes some column telling marginalized people that everything is fair. And your attempt to even suggest it isn't is racism on your part. He would say you're hurting because you haven't pulled yourself up by the bootstraps as he lays on top of you holding you down. To him, you're racist if you suggest everything is not fair in America. Greenberg either has never read King or thinks you're too stupid to go back and check the facts. Well, I have read King widely. I have read passages from the 1964 book, Why We Can't Wait, where King writes, and I quote, it is impossible to create a formula for the future which does not take into account that our society has been doing something special against the Negro for hundreds of years. And the question, how could blacks be, quote, absorbed into the mainstream of American life if we do not do something special for him now in order to balance the equation and equip him to complete, compete on, just, on a just and equal basis? King said, and I quote, it is obvious that if a man is entered at the starting line in a race 300 years after another man, the first would have to perform some impossible feat in order to catch up with his fellow runner. In fact, King specifically wrote, the nation, and I quote, must incorporate in its planning some, comp some compensatory consideration for the handicaps he has inherited from the past. All this sounds like affirmative action to me. Some might say it sounds like reparations. It sounds like social justice, which for the record promotes awareness of inequalities, action to redress inequalities, and ongoing habits of mind and actions that continue to redress inequalities. But Greenberg and those of his ilk never share these passages. But I am president of a college whose motto is, ye shall know the truth, and the truth will make you free. My point today is that we must protect Dr. King's legacy as people constantly misuse his eloquence to say something that benefits their ideology. As the villain in the Moo movie, the book of Eli stated, having the right words eloquently presented is a weapon. King's words and legacy are a powerful weapon, but in the wrong hands are used to attack all people, especially those King tried to help the most. We'll see if they print my editorial destroying the predictable case Greenberg makes. I hope lots of you will join me. Write a letter to the editor challenging this foolishness. We have to fight to make sure King is presented accurately and fairly. Like I said, I didn't have to come to welcome you to your college. This is a community meeting, 
and we've got work to do. So this meeting is officially called to order. On behalf of the Martin Luther King Jr. Commission and my fellow 12 commissioners, it's my privilege to welcome you. Many of us, although we are from all over the state, are here today, and I'd like for them to stand as I call their names. Dr. Carolyn Blakely. <laughs> Mr. Demondre Cook. Ms. Janice Waddy, Ms. Elizabeth Johnson, Ms. Lupe Pena Madison, Reverend Carolyn Staley, Mr. DeWitt Smith, Pastor E.C. Maltbia. It's his choir, <laughs> wonderful choir. Don Bland, Mr. Don Bland. And two who could not be with us today, Matty Collins and Cole Brown. The legislature and governor in recognition of the importance of having a state commission to guarantee that the life and legacy of Dr. King be remembered and broadcast throughout the state reconstituted the commission in 2009. In the 42 years since Dr. King's tragic death, two generations have been born and grown up without firsthand familiarity and awareness of the transcending role he played in the life of this country and around the world. It is a role of the commission to make certain that that role and the majestic eloquence of his words become a part of the national historic legacy. It was Dr. King's refusal in the face of hatred and neglect to submit to bitterness and violence, but rather to cling to nonviolence and the belief that love can change people's hearts that change the way we now live as a people. There remains much to do, and together with his words and adherence to his philosophy, his accurately stated philosophy, we can continue his efforts toward the perfection and healing of the world. If, in the face of the hatred and violence he encountered, the jail time he suffered, he never abandoned his beliefs and never became bitter, surely in the comfort of our lives we can continue the struggle. Let me just leave you with a few bits of his wisdom and eloquence, and eloquence. The ultimate measure of a man is not where he stands in moments of comfort and convenience, but where he stands at times of challenge and controversy. Our loyalties must transcend our race, our tribe, our class, our nation, and this means we must develop a world perspective. And lastly, hatred paralyzes life. Love releases it. Hatred confuses life. Love harmonizes it. Hatred darkens life, but love, love illuminates it. As the, <clears throat> excuse me, as the resident bishop of the United Methodist Church, in Arkansas, <clears throat> and as a member of the Board of Trustees at Philander Smith, it's a privilege to be with you, not to welcome you, but to be with you today in this place of both faith and learning. It's a time of remembrance, and I remember. I remember in the wake of Martin Luther King's death, I remember as a seminary student walking with a friend and a small group of African-American students. We walked from the campus of Duke University in Durham, North Carolina to a rally in downtown Durham. It was my first 
actual physical participation in any kind of civil rights activity. I remember, I remember the vile words and the obscene gestures emanating from passing cars, people trying to intimidate our small group of marchers. But mostly, mostly, I remember the absolute lack of fear of those around me. The idea, the hope, the dream articulated by Martin Luther King Jr. carried them with resolution as they marched. They marched really as those who were clad by the whole armor of God. For you cannot destroy an idea with gestures. You cannot crush a hope with obscenities. You cannot eradicate a dream that is rooted in God's reality and in God's word. We are all God's children. We are all beloved of God. So it is most appropriate for us to gather here on this campus where undergirded by faith, ideas are merged with hopes and dreams to create a new and just tomorrow. Where ideals and principles articulated by Martin Luther King Jr. with such clarity and power and eloquence are helping us to build the future he so clearly envisioned. There is much that remains to be done. <clears throat> to quote someone famous, if not now, when? If not us, who? With the same indomitable spirit of those marchers who helped me along the way, we simply need to put on the whole armor of God and finish the job. Welcome to the journey.
Good morning. To the members of the Martin Luther King Commission, the distinguished, even more distinguished now than ever, president of Philander Smith College, <laughs> to the program participants, to the elected officials, to all of the assembled patrons of this occasion, it is my privilege to say a few words in introduction of Coach Nolan Richardson. I hasten to add that if words were not necessary in the introduction of someone, uh, they are not necessary today because all of you know Nolan Richardson. Uh, I'll say a few words that are not printed regarding him. Uh, some things that you may know, some of you may know, and some that you may not know. Uh, Nolan grew up as the only black on a basketball team in his Hispanic town of El Paso. He learned how to speak Spanish because he lived with Hispanic people. And he, in his life, married a Hispanic woman and they have a child. A ch yes, a child. Nolan has, is what you would call truly a multicultural person. There is just no confusing him for anything other than African American. It may not be said of him that he has hair qualities or color similarities to our president, uh, but it is clear that he is uh, African American through and through. And this is really significant because uh, through his years, he's always had to meet standards that others of a lesser hue, or of a different hue, uh, did not have to meet. He had to always do better on the basketball team, do better in school, do better when he became a coach in order to be able to be given recognition. And that hard work characterized his life, as did his commitment to principle, those principles having been instilled in him by his family, largely his, grandma, his grandmother, whom he quotes dearly and fondly whenever he has an occasion to talk. When Nolan got the eye of Frank Broyles, he was a coach at Tulsa University, where he had built a very distinguished record after having won a national junior college title, a postseason NIT championship, and having distingu distinguished himself otherwise. I believe that he was hired, quite frankly, to be fired. But because he succeeded, he couldn't be fired for the longest, notwithstanding subtle efforts to move him out. And throughout his tenure, he overcame odds and obstacles during hard times. When he first went to Arkansas, he had a daughter who was, who was dying. And he had to go to the Mayo Clinic, I think it was the Mayo Clinic, on weekends to see her uh, while <clears throat> his team remained at home. He withstood all kinds of hardships. And then when he won, he was not given credit for having any brain matter. He was told that, and we were told, that he was a good recruiter. Some of you may, be, may remember Wally Hall, another icon of the Arkansas Democrat, that he was not a coach, he was simply a recruiter. He did not know how to coach, and he won because he had good players. Well, he won, and he led Arkansas to its only, the University of Arkansas, to its only national championship in a major sport, and that remains to this day. Now, <clears throat> someone said in quoting King, the, know the truth and the truth shall set you free. Nolan told me in passing as, we, as he heard those remarks, he told the truth and it got him fired. <laughs> well, it did. 
Uh, it's, uh, there is a bit of irony in this room because I represented Nolan during the trial. And of course, I had represented Nolan um, for years before then, and we had been friends over time. Uh, it's, it's interesting that when I first became acquainted with Nolan, he was called an Uncle Tom. He was called an Uncle Tom because he got along with white people, and he got along with Hispanic people, and he wasn't, you know, a torch bearer. But then when you saw his work and work, work ethic and the like, you knew that he was nobody's Uncle Tom. He was the kind of American that America says that it's seeking to produce. A person who has a work ethic, who has principles, and who's devoted to doing his job well and doing it well. Well, when we got ready to go to court, one of my former partners, Phil Kaplan, who is now the chairman of the commission, uh, was the representative of the university, and I on the other side. And that makes for interesting comment because Phil was once a civil rights lawyer. Uh, when he was with me, and I guess from time to time he still takes civil rights cases. But the occasion today in Nolan's presence was, uh, came about in part because Phil, as the chairperson of the King Commission, had the temerity to inquire of me whether Nolan was sufficiently um, favorable to appearing before an audience like this to give a speech on Martin Luther King's holiday. And because of the fact that Phil asked, I told him to call Nolan. And I think that that was somewhat traumatic for Phil, but nonetheless, that's the kind of thing that we as people have to do. We have to overcome our reluctance to deal with difficult issues and difficult people, and we have to interact with each other. Nolan did it for years at the University of Arkansas, and as he said, it got him fired. But he landed on his feet and he's a shining example of an American who means something, stood for something, and represents us all in the spirit of Martin Luther King. I introduce to you Nolan Richardson. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, you know, uh, I am very delighted to be here, and I wrote John's speech. <laughs> you said it well. I couldn't say the things he said, so I appreciate that. It is kind of ironic that uh, Phil Kaplan gives me a call and, and said that uh, would I be available for this date, and I'm, I'm really pleased and very flattered and very excited being here. I, I know that around the country, I've had the opportunities, especially in Tulsa today, they have the same thing going on over there, and I'm just going to take a job over there, and I decided to come to, to Little Rock because this is very important to me, and this state has been very important to me. That's why I may be the only coach that's ever been fired that lives right in the same house, <laughs> you know? So this day is so important from the fact that when we talk about the greatest of them all, and in my estimation, Dr. King. You know, they told me Dr. King in his early life was named Michael. I don't know if many of you knew that. He was born in 1929. He graduated from high school at the age of 15. Now what kind of man, what kind of man, a young boy at that age, is on his way to college. And see, right there, when I read that part, I knew immediately that Martin, Dr. King, was a gift. You know my best friend. My best friend died for me. His name was Jesus. He was my best friend. Okay? He died for me. And he died for you. You know? And let me say something about Dr. King. He died for us, too. I'm not saying that we are putting him on the same stage with the Almighty. But he brought him here for our belief. He brought him here to deliver us. He brought, us, brought him here to show us that we can live in the same community together and love one another because of his nonviolent 
act. You know, the bus, i never forget, looking as a youngster, when they had to set out for the buses, it lasted 382 days where no one rode the bus. 382 days. Who could have done something like that? It's a gift. He's a gift. You know, my grandfather was a semi kind of a preacher. And I, and I want to tell you this story because I tell it everywhere I go. Because I was back in those days and I remember sitting on the back of the bus. I remember that. I remember not going to the movies. I remember being the top scorer on the university's team and couldn't stay in the hotel and needed a restaurant. I remember that. Okay? But I'll never forget what old Papa told me. And that's old Mama's husband. <laughs> and he spoke in the terms of a preacher. I was about 10 years of age. And he told me a story about believing. He says, they called me Sam back then. He said, Sam, I'm 10. He says, whatever you do, you got to learn to believe. And if you believe, he says, good things can happen. He said, let me tell you something about this little boy. He was about 10 years old, too. Back in the old days, they had pop bottles. And you took them to the store and you get a deposit. You remember that? Some of you know all these youngsters, they don't know anything about that. Hell, they don't even know what a bottle looked like now. But they would give you two pennies. And this little boy saved all of his bottles all the time. And he'd go all through the neighborhood picking up bottles. And then come May 25th, school's out. He got all these bottles. He'd go into the neighborhood store and then get those deposits, make him some money. And so he did. He got his little wagon, loaded up his wagon with the bottles, and he's on his way. And all of a sudden, the wheels begin to shake. That wagon had set out in the rain, the weather, the wind, the dust, and the wheel popped off. Boom! And the wagon overturned, and the bottles hit the ground. Some of them broke. And the little boy at 10 years old said, damn. <laughs> and there was a preacher standing on the corner. And you know how they are, the reverence. He walked up to the little boy and said, son, in a reverently voice. He said, you got to believe. The boy said, yes, sir. He said, do you believe? The little boy said, yes, sir. He says, the next time something like that happened, you look up into the sky and you say hallelujah. And you'd be surprised what might happen. The little boy said, yes, sir. He says, now pick up the remainder of those bottles and carry them on to that store. So he did. The little boy fixed his wheels. And on his journey again, those wheels began to shake. And he looked up into the sky, just like the preacher told him to do. And he said, hallelujah, I believe. Please don't let these wheels fall off. Hallelujah. And he kept on moving. All of a sudden, they got to shaking harder. And they, boop, they popped off again. He looked up in the sky with a determining voice. He says, hallelujah, I believe. And you know what happened? I'm going to tell you what happened. The wheels jumped back on the wagon. <laughs> boop. The bottles that broke on the street came back, fixing in the air to sit back on the wagon. He looked back and the preacher said, damn. <laughs> what does that mean? Kill the messenger? That's all the preacher was, is the messenger. That's all he is. The little boy believed. He didn't. And that's what he taught me. Believe. Believe in what you got to do. You know what? I am so proud. I am so proud of the president, Kimbrough. He came up here and told us what God loves. You know what he loves? The truth. That's all he loves. And that's what he told us today. And I appreciate that young man because when I see youngsters that are, that, are, that are willing to fight, oh, I love you. I love you. And that's what we've got to do to keep the dream alive. 
You know, we've come a long, long ways. We got a long, long ways to go. But we're getting there. Believe me, I feel we're getting there. And Dr. King had a lot, more than a lot, to do with where we go. You know, when I read his story, six miles, 60, give me back, he traveled over six million miles. Six million miles. He did over 2,500 speeches wherever he was needed. Truly, truly, he was a gift. No one else has been gifted like that in history than Martin, a leader. And not only for his people, but for all people. All people. You know, John mentioned the fact that I grew up in a neighborhood. Well, I didn't even speak English. I never forget my first coaching job. I believe in Dr. King. He made a statement that I kept me in the back of my head forever. It said, if you're behind in the race, you got to outrun the fella in front of you. Well, hell, I've been behind all my life. And I'm constantly trying to outrun who's in front of me. And that's what we got to do. We're behind in the race. In order for us to catch up, you're going to have to outrun the people in front of you. I used to love quotations of Mr. King. Love quotations of guys who were somebody like Vince Lombardi. See, I'm not prejudiced. Vince was white. He made a statement. Fatigue will make cowards of us all. That is a truer statement in life. When you get tired, they don't want no more. I was tired at the university. Don't want no more is not the point. You get tired, you don't want no more. Therefore, you have to build energy. And energy is the key to what Dr. King is talking about for our young people. Store this energy and use it. Make it a better place to live. The last song that was sung today, boy, what a group. Guys, you guys are phenomenal. Absolutely phenomenal. Reach out and touch somebody's hand. Make it a better place, if you can. Sound like Barry White, don't I? I can do it all. All you got to do is call on me. The good man gave me the power. Just call. In closing, Dr. King meant so much to me. Dr. King and what he did inspired me. I was a young man when he first became into who he was. At the age of 35, this man was the youngest to ever win a Nobel Prize, 35 years old. He wrote five books. I got one coming out. <laughs> it's going to be pretty good, too. But it won't be like Dr. King's. But when you think of a man that's done all these magnificent things, and we're celebrating him today, even though his birthday was the 15th, we're celebrating his coming to this world and leaving it a better place than it was before. God bless all of you. Thank you.
My name is Kaylin Smith, and I am nine years old, and I am a motivational speaker, and I work as a volunteer for the Martin Luther King Commission. Working with Mr. Scarborough in the King Commission gives me great joy to surround myself with such positive people who are trying to accomplish the same goals as I of making this world a better place to live. Wow. My most memorable moment with the King Commission would have to be when we went to Memphis to participate in the march to acknowledge that the 40th year had passed since the assassination of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. I will never forget walking right along the side of Martin Luther King III and Mr. Scarborough. That was an experience I would never forget. Every man, every woman, every boy, and every girl, I am proof that you are never too young to make a difference. And now I would like to re recite a portion of Dr. King's most famous speech, I Have a Dream. I am happy to join with you today in what will go down in history as the greatest demonstration for freedom in the history of our nation. Five score years ago, a great American signed the Emancipation Proclamation, but 100 years later, the Negro are still not free. 100 years later, the Negro are still sadly crippled by segregation and the chains of discrimination. Now is the time to make real the promise of democracy. Now is the time to make justice a reality for all of God's children. No, no, we are not satisfied, and we will not be satisfied until justice rolls up like waters and righteousness like a mighty stream. I say to you today, my friends, that even though we face difficulties of today and tomorrow. I still have a dream. It is a dream deeply rooted, an American dream. I have a dream that my four little children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. I have a dream that little black boys and little black girls will be able to join hands with little white boys and little white girls as brothers and sisters. I have a dream that all of God's children will be able to sing with new meaning. My country tis of thee, sweet land of liberty, of thee I see, land where my fathers die, land of the pilgrim's pride, from every mountainside, let freedom ring. And if America is to be a great nation, this must become true. So let freedom ring from the hilltops of New Hampshire. Let freedom ring from the mighty mountains of New York. Let freedom ring from the snow-capped Rocky of Colorado. Let freedom ring from every hill and molehill of Mississippi and every mountainside. And when this happens, when we let freedom ring, we let it ring from every tenement, every hamlet, every state, and every city. We'll be able to speed up that day when all of God's children, black men, white men, Jews, and Gentiles, Protestants, and Catholics, will be able to join hands and sing in the words of the old spiritual. Free at last, free at last. Thank God Almighty, we are free at last. All right, baby. Now I have to try to come behind him. <laughs> Look what our new, our new generation is bringing to America, everyone. Just brings tears to your eyes. Matter of fact, I need a moment. <laughs> As executive director of the Arkansas Martin Luther King Jr. Commission, 
I would like to thank all of those who have participated, all of those who have made this event successful. Thank you all for your support. I would like to thank all of our special guests, including but not limited to our legislators, our judges, our mayors, and all other public officials that have come to join us this evening. You know, on January 15th, Dr. King would have celebrated his 81st birthday. And today that marks, this very day, the 24th commemorative celebration of the official national holiday. This day embarks a holiday that should be considered a day on, not a day off. A holiday in which we remember, celebrate, and act. A day we remember his legacy. We celebrate his noble leadership as a humanitarian. And we act by participating in community service and by giving back. But this day shouldn't be the only day of the year for you to give back through community service. We as human beings should serve throughout the year. You know, Dr. King once said, if you want to be important, wonderful. If you want to be recognized, wonderful. If you want to be great, wonderful. But recognize that he who is greatest among you shall be your servant. Now that's the definition of greatness. You know, everyone can serve by getting involved with your local churches, schools, communities, and even the Martin Luther King Jr. Commission. That's why, that's what makes this King holiday and what it's all about. Not a day off, but a day on. A day of service to recognize Dr. King's great contributions to society. Together in this room, we all can make change happen. Again, I would like to thank our sponsors. Today's event, because of you, this was possible. I pledge to you that the Martin Luther King Jr. Commission will be good stewards of the resources and financial blessings that were given to us to help commemorate this special day. They are Philander Smith College, Olive Garden, Fox 16, Just Communities of Arkansas, Coca-Cola, St. James United Methodist Church, Bank of Ozarks, and Sammy Cox with AEP, Southwestern Electric Power Company. Please visit our website, peruse through it, and see how you can get involved with Arkansas Martin Luther King Jr. Commission. You know, earlier Coach Richardson said, 382 days the Montgomery boycott lasted for the bus. Today, in 2010, the Arkansas Martin Luther King Jr. Commission has made a partnership with Central Arkansas Transit Authority in remembrance of Dr. King. From now on, on King Holiday, all bus rides are free of charge. At this time, I would ask that our chairman, Phil Kaplan, come and join me to the stand, to the podium. We ask Coach Richardson, could you please stand and join us? Ooh, nice. On behalf of the Arkansas Martin Luther King Jr. Commission, we would like to express our sincere gratitude for your community service, Coach Nolan Richardson, and ask that you accept this award on our behalf. Now, friends, we are going to dismiss in a second and begin for our next part of the program. But before I do, you know, the Arkansas Martin Luther King Jr. Commission, we're doing great things. Um, and one of the things that we're doing, we've just established a new youth commission, okay? And we took part at our recent retreat, December 4th, uh, 2009. And we asked that all the commissioners would bring forth a individual who is outstanding, a youth individual who is outstanding in their community and does a lot of community service. And we would like to recognize them as our youth commissioners. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask, I'm going to state a commissioner's name and ask that once I make that, say the commissioner's name, we're going to ask that youth commissioner that is representing that commissioner, please stand along with them. Mr. Com commissioner DeWitt Smith. His youth commissioner is Taylor Jane Wise. Could you please stand? <laughs> Taylor is a 16-year-old who attends Heritage High School in Rogers, Arkansas. Give her a hand. <laughs> commissioner Reverend Carolyn Staley. Her youth commissioner is Joseph Van de Greft. 
Could you please stand? Awesome young man, 16-year-old at Central High School, everyone. Commissioner Lupe Pena Madison, could you please stand? We are going to announce the youth commissioner, but that person isn't here. But that is Batel Favela. He's a senior at Hall High School, doing great things. Commissioner Elizabeth Johnson. Her youth commissioner is Rosalind Rose. Could you please stand? <laughs> Rosalind is a 10th grader at Marvel High School, everyone. Yes, we have them coming from across the state of Arkansas. Commissioner Janice Waddy, could you please stand? Her youth commissioner is Xavier Schalkerford. And he's not here, but he's 11th grader at Lee Senior High School in Mariana. Yes. <laughs> Commissioner Don Bland, could you please stand? His youth commissioner is Roderick Anderson. Is Roderick Anderson here? He could make it, but you know what? He is an eighth grader who will be 13 years old in about two weeks. Currently is a Northwest Arkansas Dream on the Dreamkeeper Walkers team. So he's doing great things up there. Give him a round of applause. Now the commissioner who brought this awesome choir to us, we want to give him a, grand, a great round of applause. Commissioner Cornell Malbia. And his youth commissioner is Maria Oates. Maria is a 15-year-old Conway High East Campus student who is doing great things, and we look forward to working with you, Maria. All the way from El Dorado, Arkansas, Commissioner Demondre Cook. Could you please stand? And his youth commissioner is Tyler Stewart, who is a 16-year-old junior at El Dorado High School. Would you please stand at this time as we prepare for the benediction and sending forth? I want to ask Pastor Mobby if he would come and just say a word about the choir because they're made of various groups. Just let Pastor Mobby do that at this time. Thank you. We want to celebrate these young people. They represent colleges in our central region. We've got college students represented from Hendricks College, the University of Central Arkansas, and UAPB as well as here at Philander. Let's give them all a great God bless you. Thank you so much. Again, we, we enjoy Coach uh, so much. Thank you for your words. Also, if you're looking for other King programs today, our very own Attorney John Walker will be speaking at the Clinton School of Public Service, and I invite you to hear him. He is quite a man. Amen. Amen. At, uh, yes, one o'clock. Twelve noon, twelve noon, twelve noon. So we invite you to attend that service. We will uh, be led by our platform to the eternal flame at this time. And I ask that if you would um, remember this time, that you remember those that have uh, that died in the struggle, that remember those that are yet in the struggle as we prepare to leave at this time. And also, those that will be participating here will be at the MIMS gym, and we'll be feeding the homeless there, but all are invited at that time to assist in that. That's at the MIMS gym. 